Hi, I'm Larry Puckett, the DCC Guy. Today, I want to talk about Keep Alives, the little electrical uh, components that can keep your locomotives rolling, even on dirty track and electrically dead sections, such as unpowered frogs. So, stick around for the video. Before we get started, I want to point out that at the end of the video, I've got some comments to make about the future of the DCC Guy channel, because there are going to be some changes made over the next few months, and I want you guys to be aware of what's going to be coming. So stick around at the end of the video after we've talked about Keep Alives, and I will go over that. Let's go ahead and get started with a look at Keep Alives and different sizes of Keep Alives and why that matters. So for that, let me go ahead and focus down here on the workbench and we'll get started. In an earlier video here on YouTube that I did, oh, I don't remember if it was a couple of years ago or a year and a half, something like that, I showed how to build uh, my own version of these little uh, Keep Alive circuits. Now, for those of you who are not aware, a Keep Alive is a device that can be attached to your decoder, and it basically acts like a little battery, okay? It's made up of several capacitors, and I've done several videos on how to build this, and how to design these, and modify them, how to connect them, and I will make, uh, I will uh, go ahead, right above me here, and on the end page for this uh, video, I will place links to the previous videos that I've done on Keep Alive. But what I want to do today is talk about size, because I constantly hear from folks who were, are looking for, you know, ways to make their Keep Alive smaller and uh, squeeze these little guys into smaller locomotives, because that can be a real problem. If we go back and look at the current Keeper, you know, it's about the same size as the large a homemade one that I showed you guys how to build. This particular one is rated at 15 volts, and I believe the uh, this one, probably because it's got uh, a voltage regulator circuitry and the like built in, can go up to about 18 volts, but I, I'm not sure about that. But at any rate, that's the current keeper. Uh, another version of the Keep Alive that I built uses uh, three volt capacitors. These are the super capacitors. Okay, so the, each one of these is rated at three volts. So it'll get you about 15 volts. And it's much smaller than this one here, as you can see. Well, what about, you know, fitting things into small switchers and things of like of that, where these, no matter what you do, you're not gonna be able to get those in unless you're talking about a steam locomotive with a tender attached uh, that you can push these into. So how do you go about getting around that. Well, one option, of course, is to switch to a Keep Alive that's designed slightly different. This one is a uh, more of a rectangular instead of a longitudinal uh, type of setup. This is made by uh, NCE. It's called their No Halt. So it's a, it's a possible option. But again, it really is no smaller in the long run than something like this that you can build at home. Um, and by the way, uh, I'm going to be doing one of the first videos that I'm going to be reshooting, and I'll talk about that in a minute, uh, is this one here on how to build uh, these uh, Keep Alives. And I'll try to uh, do a little bit better job of showing you how to make these smaller ones. Now, but what about uh, companies that make small Keep Alives? Well, let's, let's zoom in just a little bit more so I can show you this. Basically, here we go, the only company that I know of that really makes a nice small Keep Alive is TCS. And by the way, there's the only ones that can really be called Keep Alives because uh, I'm not sure if I think it's a copyright or whatever. At any rate, they came up with the name Keep Alive first and they put their name on it, and it is theirs legally. So these are Keep Alives. This is a Stay Alive device. It is not a Keep Alive. However, most people call all of them Keep Alives. At any rate, so what's available as far as smaller? Well, you can see these here. This is an older uh, version of a TCS Keep Alive, 
and it is their uh, KA2. And you can see it is smaller than this one here, and uh, it does a very good job. It will work not only with TCS decoders, but it will work with anybody else's uh, decoders, uh, and very, very well, as I might point out. Um, and in another video that I did, I showed how to connect all of these various different types of keep alive to different types of decoders. So this is the TCS KA2. Now, they also did this one here. Uh, it only has uh, four capacitors in it, so it's a little bit smaller. And you can see it's much smaller than this one here that I made, and it's even smaller than their KA2, which has five uh, capacitors. So that's why it's smaller. Okay, now, but what's even smaller? Well, if you need to really cram something in a small locomotive, uh, one thing that uh, they came up with a number of years ago uh, was this KA4. So you can see it's got four capacitors in it, one, two, three, four, and it does a very good job of uh, keeping uh, your locomotives from stalling uh, on dirty track and, and electrically dead sections. So that's another option. But finally, uh, about a year ago now, I think it was, maybe a little earlier than that, they came up with a new design called their KA1 and their KA2. So they replaced this KA2 with this one here, and that's no longer available. There used to be a bigger one called a KA1. This is the new KA1 here. The nice thing about these is these are really really tiny. As you can see, uh, compared to a, uh, let's say, a current keeper. Sorry folks, it uh, soundtracks, but I'm just doing this for demonstration. You can see that their KA1 is demonstrably smaller. It's thinner, it's shorter, it's narrower. It's going to fit into a lot of places. Their KA2, it's ranged, uh, arranged in a bundle of four uh, supercapacitors. Um, in a square, and as you can see, it really will fit in a lot of tiny places. These are two keep alives that I have found very useful for using uh, on very small installations. And you know, they um, will fit into some of my, uh, and here this is for you UK guys, these will fit into my little uh, 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 PT switchers, my little tankers. All those kind of things, and I'll have some videos showing those. I use these in the um, uh, GWR 060 PTs that I uh, uh, showed how to install decoders in, uh, in a video, couple of videos um, um, about six months ago. And if I've got room, I'll add that to the list as well of videos, uh, links above here. Uh, I can only do so many. I can only do, I think, three uh, video links. But at any rate, you can see how small these are. And you can really tuck these away in a lot of very tight places. They'll fit in the back underneath of a coal load um, uh, hatch on a lot of the little uh, uh, 060 PTs. Uh, they'll fit in a lot of, uh, of uh, North American uh, switcher prototypes uh, that I've been using a lot lately. And uh, basically, you can really squeeze these in. Now, where are these available? Of course, these are available off of the TCS website. And for you guys in England and the UK, um, TCS now has uh, a UK website. And uh, if you go to tcsdcc.com, uh, uh, they have a link right there on their main website to their UK uh, website. And you can uh, uh, purchase uh, components, keep alive, decoders, the whole nine yards, from them, from their UK dealer. And um, so these make a really good option. They're going to work no matter where, uh, as long as you get them installed correctly. And again, I did a video previously on how to make the connection. I think it was called Keep Alive's Making the Connection. So I talked about how to figure out how to attach these to other types of decoders besides the uh, TCS uh, decoders. Now, they're, they're not obviously going to uh, keep a uh, locomotive running as long as something like this one with a lot of big fat capacitors. These little guys, as you can see here, are very, very small capacitors. And I don't know where they get them. I don't know. You know, I've looked all over the place. 
I have not been able to find these little tiny supercapacitors that they are using. I wish I could, but unfortunately, uh, so far, these are the smallest uh, supercapacitors that I have been able to find. Um, right now, then, you pretty much, these sell uh, for about $25, $26 uh, at this time. I just ordered one recently, and I think I paid $26 for it from Streamline Backshop. And there are various companies on eBay and the like that sell these as well uh, for about that price. And that, in most cases, that includes free shipping. So uh, take a look at those. And, um, you know, if you need more power and have the room, you can use something like this one here. Or, of course, one of the other uh, soundtracks uh, type um, devices. And, or, you know, our friends at NCE. Digitrax has a, a, a small one as well that will fit in a lot of places and, and works well with their decoders. So that's about it. They're, they're a fairly straightforward, easy to use type of component. And as I say, they will uh, keep your locomotives from stalling on dirty track, electrically dead track, and you know, you just won't have problems like locomotives stalling when they go across an unpowered frog, such as a Pico Insel frog, or as is very common, uh, when they cross a set of points, uh, and those are sometimes can be kind of irregular. And that's another problem with small uh, steam switchers and steam locomotives, because they have those, you know, six or eight uh, drivers, or even uh, in smaller uh, switchers, four drivers, um, you know, that basically do not move very well uh, up and down. Uh, if they get on some irregular track, it's very easy for them to lose that electrical continuity, that contact with the track, and suddenly stall. And you'll see that in a lot of cases where uh, locomotives will stop dead as they go across an insulated frog, a dead frog, or across a set of points. Because, you know, those can be irregularities, and the locomotives, the steam locomotives in particular, are very sensitive to that. Diesels are not as sensitive, mainly because the uh, trucks themselves uh, pivot uh, on the bolsters, and you've got two sets of trucks, you know, or two trucks um, uh, widely spaced apart, so it tends to even this problem out. So diesels, in my opinion, are not as sensitive to those kind of factors as steam locomotives. Now, as I said, I want to uh, go over some of the changes that are coming to the DCCI channel starting this fall. And one of them right off is the name. Uh, the DCC guy kind of hems me in. I felt kind of uh, locked in to doing topics that are directly related to DCC. And, you know, over the last few months, over the last year, really, I have managed to squeeze in a few other topics like ballasting and, you know, a tour of the layout and some tips about scenery that I use here on the layout. But, you know, there's a lot of other things that I would like to be able to do. And uh, in order to really get me out of that box of the DCC guy, uh, there's going to be a slight change in the name. Uh, starting as soon as I get a chance to get it uh, changed, uh, the name is going to be Model Railroading with the DCC guy. So I'm going to broaden the scope of some of the videos. You'll see more on general model railroading topics uh, in addition to the DCC topics that I've been doing all along. Now, another issue uh, is the talking head kind of videos. The videos where I just stand here and basically uh, give a lecture on some, am some aspect of DCC, like uh, ops mode versus service mode programming. They're informative, and you know, basically that's one, uh, one good way to get the information across, and, and it's available on the channel when the question comes up for you. But what I want to do is be in a position where I can do more hands-on type videos like the one I did not too long ago on uh, converting uh, older turnouts to DCC-friendly uh, configurations. And I, I really want to be able to do more of those, and that's a change that you're going to be uh, seeing in the future. To address that and to make it possible to do more hands-on stuff, um, I really can't crawl under the layout here. I can't get in between uh, different levels on the bench work and shoot videos. It just doesn't work. 
So what I'm going to be doing over the next few months, I'm going to be building a, sw a small switching layout. For you guys in the UK, a shunting layout. And it's going to be something on the order of two feet wide by about eight feet long. And that's going to give me the ability to show you things like how I build the bench work here for the Piedmont Southern, uh, how I lay track, how I uh, lay switches, how or turnouts or points as, as some call them, uh, how I go about installing tortoise switch machines, you know, how I do a DCC power bus, all those kind of things that would require me to shoot underneath of the layout. However, in this case, with a small portable switching layout, I can just tip it up on its side and do it right in front of the camera without any problems at all. So that's one thing uh, that I think you'll look uh, be looking to see in the future, uh, starting as soon as I get a chance uh, to proceed with the design and cobble together the uh, components to begin the layout. Because there are a few things that I still need to buy in order to, uh, to put it together. So uh, look forward to that. And you know, for a lot of people, a switching layout is something that has become quite popular uh, among model railroaders, particularly those who live in cramped quarters, maybe an apartment or a condo, or uh, you know, even in, in some smaller houses, they just don't have room for a large uh, freestanding layout uh, like I have here filling my basement. So uh, for those people, uh, hopefully you'll be able to uh, take off on this and build your own small switching layout and, and enjoy that aspect of the hobby as well. Now, in addition to my American viewers, which represent probably something on the order of about 60% of the uh, folks who watch my videos, uh, I have a large overseas following representing the other 40%. And the biggest uh, um, um, uh, group amongst those are in the UK. And they come in at about 10%. And uh, I keep getting uh, uh, comments asking me to do more uh, videos related directly to uh, the UK. Also, as some of you may know from previous videos I've done, I do have a thing for uh, small British uh, steam locomotives, uh, particularly those of the Great Western Railway. And uh, so one of the things that I'm going to be doing um, on a fairly regular basis is producing some videos uh, focused directly on UK topics, UK locomotives, installing decoders in UK locomotives, building certain uh, UK based uh, structures and the like, and uh, we'll go from there and see what happens with it. Uh, hopefully it will satisfy my UK uh, folks and uh, I can address some of their uh, questions and, and comments. Um, and as for uh, others, such as those in Canada and Australia and New Zealand who make up the, the, sec the second largest group after the UK folks, I guess that's the third largest group as a whole, um, the UK, England in particular, is the mother country for many of us. And uh, my family, you know, we got away from it back around 1640. But uh, for many uh, who live in, in those other countries, you know, they derive from the from England and the UK. And so hopefully they'll be interested in this topic as well. And, you know, some of you folks here in North America might actually be interested uh, in how uh, model railroading and railroading evolved in other countries, such as England in particular. So that's something, it'll be probably maybe one to two a month at the most, but something uh, you guys in the UK hopefully can look forward to. I really didn't get serious about developing a YouTube channel until about a year ago. It was about middle of August of uh, 2019. Uh, prior to that, you know, I've been doing this in, uh, for over five years now, but I just used YouTube as a platform for uh, loading videos that could be uh, uh, used with my post on my, my website. Um, and, you know, that was before I, I got serious about uh, purchasing a decent uh, video camera and lights and, and microphone, external microphone, all of those kind of things that make it easier uh, to achieve better quality videos. And I, I hope I've done that. I, you, you can tell me uh, whether or not they've improved over the last year. But at any rate, one of the things I'm thinking about doing is going back and reshooting some of the earlier videos. So if you see some duplication uh, on the channel, uh, for a while, you know, like uh, a, a new video on building uh, Keep Alives, 
um, that's why, okay? It's because I'm going back, reshooting. Hopefully I'll actually be able to update some of those and add uh, more material uh, than I had in the past. So we'll see how that goes as well. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, wrap this up. And I want to thank you guys for watching the channel. You know, we're over 7,000 subscribers now, which is, you know, better than I thought I was going to do uh, a year ago. But, you know, hopefully by the end of the year, I would like to see at least 10,000. I would be uh, just blown away if I could get 10, uh, 12,000 subscribers by the end of uh, 2020. So talk it up with your friends and your, uh, and your club members and things of that nature, your modeling buddies, and recommend the uh, model railroading with the DCC Guy channel to them as well. Thanks a lot now and have a great weekend. Bye.